All right, so, um, so today we're gonna uh, continue with the description of um, effective field theory, but from a different point of view, from a point of view of a uh, kind of discretization, and as a result, um, this will have uh, application for condensed matter physics. Um, so we saw that the randomization group was um, a relation, um, was an evolution in um, the energy scale of the uh, evolution of the coupling constants of the theory in the energy scale. Um, but uh, in this, um, uh, energy scale can be um, uh, well, Fourier transformed or equivalently, um, we can think of it in uh, uh, in a coordinate scale. And specifically, if we if we discretize this coordinate, evolution in uh, in coordinate scale means um, averaging over. Um, uh, over a set of uh, coordinates, over a set of points, of discrete points, um, which uh, also makes it more explicit, perhaps, um, from the point of view of the effective field theory last time, where we saw that um, the evolution of the parameters with the energy scale came from integrating out high energy degrees of freedom. Now, these degrees of freedom are explicit in the sense that they are actual points, discrete points, um, which in condensed matter will associate with uh, some atoms or, or so. So that's the general idea. And now let's make it um, more precise. First of all, um, so, I said atoms and condensed matter physics, but what we'll specifically be concerned with today um, are spin systems. So we reduce the degree of freedom to just the degree of freedom related to uh, to some uh, atom or point to uh, basically the simplest you can have, namely a spin. A spin degree of freedom. <clears throat> so let's consider the scalar Lagrangian, the kinetic term, I mean, Euclidean in space, with the kinetic term uh, and the potential, and perhaps the source. Um, and, uh, and we'll consider uh, quantum field theory, that is to say, path integral. So, um, and then let's con let's discretize this by putting the field on a lattice, the simplest lattice possible, hypercubic, meaning um, all distances between uh, uh, distances in in, uh, in planes are uh, between neighboring uh, atoms are equal, and uh, this is the same for all um, uh, all planes. And the lattice size will be, uh, the value of the lattice size will be A. So then instead of X, we'll have an Xn. Instead of phi of X, we'll have a phi N, which means phi of Xn. The path integral measure, um, curly D phi, uh, which in any case was defined via discretization, now uh, specifically means a product of d phi n's, that is to say, product of d phi of xn overall n. And in, in the discretization, of course, uh, the derivative in um, a direction mu um, means phi n plus mu, where n plus mu means sorry, phi n plus mu minus phi n over a, where phi n plus mu means the nearest neighbor on the lattice of phi n in the direction mu. So it's, we have derivative with respect to mu, to, to x mu. 
Um, so this is phi of xn plus mu. So xn, uh, you go in the direction mu um, to the nearest neighbor. This is the variation of phi divided by the variation of x. So then the discretized action is uh, so from the dxn, uh, so, sorry, from the d, d, dx, d, dx, so dx is replaced with a, that's the, sim, that's the sh shortest, uh, um, shortest uh, distance in, uh, in the lattice. And uh, we're in d dimensions, so it's a to the d. And then sum over points n, <clears throat> the del mu phi squared is this thing squared, so 1 over a squared phi n plus mu minus phi n squared divided by 2, and the sum over mu, of course, plus v of phi n and j n phi n. In the particular, particular case of uh, the lambda phi 4 theory, uh, lambda phi 4, the potential la being lambda phi 4 over 4 factorial, we rescale the variables in order to absorb the dependence on A and to put the coupling outside in the action, the same way as um, in, let's say, in Young Mills or Maxwell, we can rescale A mu in order to put the action into an action that doesn't depend on g divided by g squared. We'll do the same here. So uh, we'll also call the action that comes out outside, the, the uh, coupling that comes outside, we'll also call it g. But since in the potential we have this lambda, we write lambda as 1 over g squared times a to the power d minus 4, All right? So then, at least from the potential, you see that um, um, sorry, that doesn't work out. Hmm. Something is wrong here. It depends on G is wrong. Uh, Well, let's see. So, okay, so this is correct. Five, so phi is written as phi prime over G. And also over one over a to the d over two minus one. So then this term has a one over g squared. But then here is phi four, so we'll have one over g four. So I have to write lambda instead of g to the plus two. Okay, and then a to the d minus four. Let's see, uh, a to the d minus 4 uh, divided by a to the d minus 2d minus 4. So it's 1 over a to the d, which with a to the d cancels, OK. And then this one, a to the d minus 2, uh, d minus 2. Minus, uh, 
1 over a to the d minus 2 times a squared. So 1 over a to the d with this cancels. OK. So this is OK. And then this is, yeah, this is also OK because it gets 1 over g squared. Then this term cancels. And then 1 over a to the d also cancels. OK. <coughs> So by writing this, um, I, I rewrite the action without uh, powers of A and also without coupling. I have just the, the interaction is just uh, five prime to four to the five prime to the four over four factorial. Um, and then I also consider the possibility of having an M squared. Uh, m squared phi squared over 2. But in that case, because of this, um, I'll get the dimensionless coupling m squared a squared. Um, and then this action is divided in exponent by g squared. So I have exponent minus s divided by g squared. And then uh, d phi prime. Uh, d phi becomes d phi prime over g. Um, and then there's these powers of a that go into this, com this uh, uh, normalization constant there that we'll, we anyway have. OK. Um, so this uh, partition function at this point, this discretized partition function written in this way, has the form of a classical spin system. Um, let's see that. Um, so, for instance, a ferromagnet uh, has, as you might remember, the Hamiltonian where uh, spins interact. So I have the spin at, uh, at uh, point n. Uh, vector product with a spin at uh, point m with a coefficient v and m and then sum of n m. Um, so th this is the Hamiltonian. So it's, and it's with a minus because when the spins are aligned, um, this is the lowest energy. So it's minus something maximal. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and then we also. This is Hamiltonian depends on the spins in this way, but also um, depends on an external field that you can add. So you can add an external field, H, um, that uh, would interact with uh, the spin. So little H here. Um, can be. Uh, mu b, for instance, um, uh, and uh, times the, the total uh, spin of the system, which is sum of m uh, s m. And the partition function, in this case, it's a, it's a integral over all spins. So integral of the product over n of dsn. That's the measure. Uh, that, that's the uh, integration measure. But then there's also a weight. Um, so a weight rho of Sn, in principle, you can you can add a weight of rho of Sn describing the spin. I mean, describing how the spin relates to the idealized spin that. Um, that we wrote in this uh, Hamiltonian. And then the usual exponent, the usual Boltzmann factor exponent minus Hamiltonian over KBT. And I write, as usual, beta is 1 over KBT. Um, now, this weight should really depend on the uh, value squared, the modulus squared of the spin. So really. Sn squared, this is a vector. 
Um, and it's also naturally exponentiated, meaning large spins are exponentially small, uh, should be, uh, should be um, exponentially small. So, so then writing a phenomenological description for this uh, measure means uh, writing rho of s n as something being proportional to e to the minus. So here I, I write an expansion uh, in uh, s n squared with all possible powers, but I just, I mean, it's phenomenological. And then I, um, I just uh, stop at uh, Sn to the fourth. So I write minus k Sn squared plus lambda Sn4. Exactly. So this is a phenomenological form. But then the exact form will be given by the microscopic properties of the spin. <coughs> the, now, if the system has an only a nearest neighbor interactions, then this sum over an M in the uh, spin, spin, spin interaction will um, will be replaced, will degenerate into um, sum over N, sum over points, and then sum over mu, where mu is the nearest point to N, the direction. So then sum over an M, VNM, SNM, goes over minus this K, sum over n, sum over mu, then s squared, well, sn dot sn means, uh, so this is minus sn dot sn, um, but then this comes from sn plus mu minus sn squared, right, the cross term. Of course, there's still sum over, uh, sum over n, sum over n, Sn plus mu squared, and then another sum of n, sum of m mu, Sn squared. But uh, but these two are equal. They're just you know it's just a, a, a shift by mu. So these are just Sn squared. So uh, and then Sn squared means I mean for then sum of mu, the directions, uh, the nearest neighbor in, in all, all dimensions is a factor of d. So to, to cancel these things, I, I, do, I subtract minus 2d, 2 because there are two terms, d because it's sum of mu, s n squared. <clears throat> and so the partition then, become partition function becomes integral product of these dsn, e to minus beta h. Well, h depends on uh, the spin, on the coupling k here, on the nearest neighbor mu, on the coupling uh, lambda in five, five spin to the four, and on external field h. And is written like this. And all of these things, all of the coefficients in principle depend on temperature. This is a complicated microscopic description where uh, the temperature um, can change the properties. In particular, you can have phase transitions and so on. Um, so, so this would be the general form with sum of n, kb, k of beta, sum of mu, sn plus mu, minus sn squared, plus mu of beta, sn squared, plus lambda of beta, sn4, plus h, sn. Um, now, um, so this is the most general form, but uh, uh, but by, by, sorry, oops. But by comparing to what you, we got from here, we, we find that k of beta is a constant k from before. Um, mu of beta is uh, k over beta. We have this k divided by beta. And then minus 2d 
times k. Um, and then mu of beta, sorry, this is mu of beta, yeah. And then uh, lambda of uh, beta is lambda divided by beta, right? Sn to the four is lambda um, divided by beta because I, I so I, I put this row into, I put this row into um, the Hamiltonian. So I write this as E minus beta times this thing divided by beta. Okay, so we look at this mu of beta and we see that there are two opposing terms. So as beta varies, this can be either positive or negative, right? So, well, in this particular case, um, I mean, of course, here I've written things in, without dimension, so. Uh, it's it's uh, a little bit uh, sketchy, but uh, for beta equal to um, beta equal to let's see one over two d, right? Then this mu of beta would be zero. But in any case, for some, uh, and so that that would would give me some t critical, some critical temperature where beta equal to zero. But anyway, if there's some beta critical corresponding to some critical temperature at which mu equal to zero. And that obviously corresponds to a phase transition. Um, a phase transition, <coughs> which as you know, so this is the, the, the quadratic term in the, in the Hamiltonian. So it's the, what we wrote here is a spin version of the the most general, more general, well, um, yeah, spin and and quantum mechanical version of the um, of uh, of Landau's theory of uh, of phase transitions, right? Where now the the um, the order parameter is the uh, the average value of the spin. So the average value. So if mu is positive, is if the quadratic term in the Hamiltonian, quadratic term in the mass, or uh, if, if in the mass in terms of uh, of uh, fields, if you think of this in terms of field theory. Or uh, the quadratic term in the in the order parameter. If you think of the um, uh, Landau theory of phase transition, um, so if the if this term is positive and there's no external field, there's no um, linear term, then we have no magnetization. Magnetization is proportional to the average value of the spin, right? That's what magnetization is. Um, and then, uh, so the average value of the spin means one over the volume, sum of n, uh, uh, quant quantum value of uh, the spin Sn. Um, and this would be zero in this case. I mean, just you look at this and figure out that the uh, spin can only be, uh, if, if you want a constant spin, if you want to minimize the Hamiltonian, you get a quantum spin that is equal to zero. Um, it, it, it's constant that is equal to zero. Then the, the sum of the spin is also zero. On the other hand, if this quadratic term is negative and there's no external spin, so there's no external, uh, field so uh, no term linear in the spin. Then the classical minimum the Hamiltonian is uh, at non-zero uh, constant Sn, right? So constant Sn means this term is zero, and then you minimize the sum of these two, 
two terms. This is negative, this is positive. And the sum is the then Sn is this constant minus mu over two lambda. So the magnetization then is the same. I mean one of volume sum of n cancels because this all is a constant. Then is magnetization is just uh, this. Moreover, since as we saw in this example, you know, near uh, beta critical, so near uh, the critical temperature, it, this is uh, a const. This is proportional to beta minus beta critical. I mean, so in this example it would be um, minus beta minus beta critical over beta, but in any case, near beta critical is something proportional to beta critical. So I'll write mu of beta as some constant times beta minus beta critical. Um, <clears throat> so this, this fact is it's on one hand give, uh, given by the example that we, we wrote, and on the other hand, you can think phenomenologically. So mu of beta, we see that for positive beta, we have zero magnetization. For negative beta, you have magnetization proportional to square root of beta, uh, to the square root of mu. <clears throat> so, uh, so assuming the mass term is smooth, uh, then um, um, then you tailor expand if you want, and you keep only the the first term. Right. So it's some c zero times beta minus beta critical. But then, if this thing is positive, then is if beta is higher than beta critical, the magnetization proportional square root of mu, therefore with square root of beta minus beta critical. And you note that this is a non-analytic behavior. Analytic would be this one, right? That with Taylor expansion, with uh, just powers of uh, of beta minus beta critical, but this is a square root, so it's non-analytic. It had the it had the, the cut. <clears throat> now, um, so in general, the magnetization will depend both on beta like here, but also on the uh, external field H. So this analysis was at zero external field. So zero H or zero uh, term, no term linear in, in the spin. Um, and so in general, uh, the magnetization is as before, some one over V, some of N, uh, quantum wave of Sn. Quantum wave of Sn then means path integral, meaning integral product dsp, exponent minus beta h, and then insert also Sn. <clears throat> On the other hand, the suscepti magnetic susceptibility chi, in general susceptibility um, in the, in the um, um, in the linear um, linear response uh, 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 theory, in, in general, you define susceptibility as as the um, derivative of the um, of the resulting uh, quantity by the field that you. Uh, by the field or, or quantity that you um, input it. So here you input an external uh, magnetic field and the result is a magnetization. So the susceptibility is the derivative of this magnetization with respect to the external field. And uh, doing this, uh, um, doing this, um, uh, this derivative, as you see, the uh, external field only appears in the exponent in uh, H, in the Hamiltonian. So 
I get down a uh, minus beta uh, derivative of, uh, of the Hamiltonian with respect to this uh, the external field. And that's uh, sum of n uh, sm. But since I already have an index n, this would be sum of n sm, which is what I got here. And also beta. Um, there should have been a minus sign, I guess. Because it's minus beta h. Well, I guess that's a, a convention, but uh, I would put here a minus sign. <clears throat> um, now, this one, this can be rewritten if you look at what is inserted in here. Uh, it's inserted sum over n, sn, sum over m, sn. Right? Um, and it can be rewritten, therefore, and there's also one over v. It can be rewritten, so, and the remaining thing um, the remaining thing is uh, is just uh, the quantum web. Uh, this can be rewritten then as one over v, sum over n and m, quantum web of uh, uh, product of Sn minus quantum web of S and Sm minus quantum web of S. In other words, this would be what's uh, the, the two-point function of fluctuations of the spin. That's what you you um, that's what you would call it, right? <clears throat> so that's uh, that's true in general. These susceptibilities are uh, two-point functions of uh, fluctuations in the variable that we are interested in. Um, now, uh, the two point function, this two point function at large distances behaves like an exponential. So, in this theory, you in general have, um, have a quantity called correlation length and de denoted by psi that defined the these two point function so large distances means um, the 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 modulus of xn minus xm being much larger than this psi and this psi will depend on the parameters meaning on the temperature or on beta and on the external field h um, so in this con in this um, under this condition, this is goes like exponent minus x n minus x, modulus x n minus x n divided by x i. Um, whereas at small distances, so in the opposite limit, uh, modulus x n minus x n much smaller than x i, but still much greater than a the lat lattice size. Um, then this two-point function, um, in this case, this two-point function would not um, um, would not uh, see the the existence of of psi. So it will be it will be like a scale invariant theory. So if I revert this in terms of energy, I would say energy is much greater than the er energy associated to psi, much greater than one over psi. Uh, so at high energies, you don't see the mass scale, the small mass scale. So the theory looks kind of conformal. And then the only possibility for this two-point function is to be a power law in the, 
the modulus xm minus xm. And it also must be a diverging um, diverging uh, quantity. So it be, that means it's uh, the modulus of xm minus xm to a minus, to minus a, a positive number. And that positive number is what? So there's clearly the dimension associated with uh, this two-point function first, the classical dimension, and that's d minus two. Um, well, you can see that uh, um, let's see. I'm going to see that um, well, I guess I guess from this form. Yeah, so this is d minus two. So you think of this as spin, the dimension would be d minus two. But this is by comparing the field theory. So, um, so would have this classical dimension of uh, of two d minus two, but then plus. Uh, an eta, which is called anomalous dimension by the same logic as in uh, quantum field theory. Since in any way, we'll, we'll, we are basically relating quantum field theory with this um, quantum theory of spins. So eta is then an anomalous dimension. <clears throat> um, So, uh, so we know that the susceptibility blows up at the phase transition. Um, um, which is another way of saying that at the phase transition, um, um, one of a psi goes to zero. So one of a psi uh, is a mass scale, and so at the phase transition, there's no more mass scales in the theory because the mass, um, the mass scale is this mu, and this mu goes to zero. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so that means, uh, and this singular behavior then is also associated with, uh, so when psi goes to infinity, then uh, there's no more, there's no such exponential uh, behavior anymore. This is exponent, exponentially small, so in, at large, distance is much larger than psi, this is exponentially small, whereas the distance is much smaller than psi, this is diverging. Since psi is also infinity, it's always diverging. So psi going to infinity is equivalent to the two-point function going to uh, diverging. Um, so the, the phase transition is uh, associated with the uh, psi going to infinity, which is associated with the diverging in two-point function. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, sine going to infinity mean, means one of xi goes to zero, so there's no ma mass scale in the theory. There's nothing with dimension at the, this phase transition, which means the theory is scale invariant. Um, scale invariant, we said, it means fixed under a transformation, a multiplication by a scale. So. That means all diverging quantities must diverge as a power law. Why is that? Because exponent, if we have, if we have an exponent, you could see here, if we have an exponent, you can only write it in terms of, so exponent in terms uh, uh, of uh, 
the exponent must be exponent of something dimensionless. But to make it something dimensionless out of uh, something with dimension, you need the mass scale. So since you don't have mass scale anymore, you cannot construct an exponent. So the only thing you can construct is power laws in X. Um, <clears throat> Um, now, in the quadratic approximation around the minimum of the spin, um, we can calculate, though you can also figure out due to the dimension, so this mu by comparison with, uh, with a field theory must have dimension uh, 2, this is like mass squared. Um, so uh, on the other hand, psi by looking in here is a dimension of uh, minus one. It's a it's a uh, length. So psi must be proportional to one over square root of mu. Um, <clears throat> so, but you can also calculate this. So either way, either calculate or think about it in terms of this dimensional analysis. <clears throat> but then you can see that indeed what we said was correct because at the phase transition we, we just saw that the phase transition mu goes to zero and then psi goes to infinity, psi indeed diverges. Um, we can also define uh, we can also define um, critical exponents. Um, so near the phase transition means uh, near beta critical. Um, so beta minus beta critical is small. And near um, the phase transition, we saw that the susceptibility uh, we saw that uh, the correlation length diverges. And we also um, can figure out, I mean, we saw this two-point function diverges as well, so chi diverges. So um, uh, both uh, beta, uh, both uh, uh, psi and uh, chi uh, must diverge near, uh, when beta goes to beta critical. And since this is the only um, mass scale available near the phase transition point, this must be a power law, a, a, a negative power law of beta minus beta critical. And the power law in chi is, will be called gamma, and the power law in uh, psi will be called uh, nu. And these exponents gamma and nu, and perhaps also for other diverging quantities, will be called critical exponents. And these critical exponents can only take uh, a few values. They're not continuously, in, in uh, physical theories, they're not um, continuous uh, parameters. They can take very few um, possible um, uh, values, which means there is a certain universality for them. A large class of theories have this, has the same, um, uh, the same critical exponents independent of the microscopic of the theory, of the macroscopic theory. But near the phase transition, you all, the large class of theory looks the same. <coughs> Um, okay, now let's define Kadanov blocking. So the the the, um, uh, the subject of today's lecture, as I said, is to define randomization group in terms of um, uh, of uh, going of uh, transformation by scale by integrating out degrees of freedom, or 
another way of averaging over um, some uh, uh, over some uh, uh, block in space, and that procedure that of averaging over some block is called Kadanov blocking. And the procedure over this averaging in a discrete space. So since we have uh, formulated uh, this discretized field theory as a spin system, we'll, we'll talk about it in the same way. So we'll not distinguish whether we're talking about spin or uh, spins or, or field theory. So uh, generically then I'll I'll write this uh, write it in in this uh, field theory notation with uh, Hamiltonian one half phi n plus mu minus phi n squared plus mu phi n squared plus lambda phi n four and this cadan of blocking or Averaging over uh, a block in discretized space is as follows. So we divide the lattice into blocks of size s to the d. D is the dimension of space. So uh, in each direction, I have a, a size d, a size s. So s is a number, a natural number, which means an, a number of um, of sites on the lattice. So we average the, the field over these blocks, meaning I sum uh, phi n over for, for n uh, in this block of size s. And then, um, and then divide by uh, this size, one over s to the d. But uh, but I want after this procedure to go back to the original size of the um, of the lattice. So I def I redefine x um, x with so x had uh, lattice size a. So I want now to redefine an x to have again the lattice size a. So that means I defined x s to be x over s. <clears throat> um, but then since so psi was a was a correlation length was a, a, a an object in the theory um, by redefining psi by redefining x then uh, psi has also decreased by s so Xi s is also Xi over s. But since the two-point function, two-point function decays as a power for the case of um, the distance, this discrete distance, I'll call it n. So distance in uh, x space would be n times the lattice size a. Um, so n much smaller than Xi. I mean xi here. I, I mean xi over a in the same way. Um, then um, the two-point function would go like a power law. So one over n, n being the uh, the dis discrete uh, distance between uh, the two fields. Um, at this uh, power law, d minus two plus eta, right? Said d minus two plus eta. <clears throat> um, but uh, but then by uh, so um, by re but then by rescaling x, so this goes like x or n to the to this power law, and but I rescale x. So to be consistent, I also have to rescale phi, since the power law goes like uh, a power of x. <laughs> and this power then is, so this is a two-point function. This is mm, this power law divided by 2, d 
d minus 2 plus eta over 2. Um, and this uh, uh, rescaling of phi by s to the alpha into phi s, as you see, looks like a wave function normalization in the quantum field theory sense. It's a multiplication by, um, by a, a factor that in principle can be infinite. Well, it's finite in, if, if, on a lattice, but in, if you're not on a lattice, this number could be infinite. Um, <clears throat> now, the new Hamiltonian now is found by just by averaging over the, the, blo the blocks, right? So I write exponent minus beta h prime of phi prime at n prime. So this is the new Hamiltonian in terms of the new field at the new coordinate is just the average. So I write the path integral with e minus beta h of phi, so the product integral product d phi n exponent minus beta h of phi. But then I um, I put these uh, delta functions this oh, for the averaging. So the averaging was this one. And then I put this delta function for phi and prime being equal to uh, this average over phi. And then, of course, I put products over n prime, uh, n prime being the new, um, uh, the new spatial coordinate, this is the spatial coordinate. So after this averaging, the rescaled Hamiltonian um, um, the rescaled Hamiltonian is defined um, in this way. So I um, yeah. So I write h, h, uh, hs of phi s of x i s is by definition this h prime of phi prime of x prime. However, by doing this averaging will generate new terms in the Hamiltonian. So in the classical Hamiltonian, we had just this kinetic term, mass term, and phi 4 term. But by doing, uh, um, by doing this blocking, we'll generate new types of Hamiltonians, new types of terms in the Hamiltonian. So for instance, what can I get? get? Well, I can get all, all sorts of terms, but I, here I get, gave two examples. So phi n squared, phi n plus mu minus phi n squared is what? Well, this thing we saw that it corresponds to d phi squared, kinetic term. And then this is just phi squared. So this is phi squared d phi squared. Um, also, I can get phi n plus mu minus 2 phi n plus phi n minus mu. Well, you can kind of figure out what this is because this is, if, if I call this phi prime n, this thing is phi prime n plus mu minus phi prime n. And this is the first derivative. So then this is just the second derivative. So this is, uh, this is d squared in the direction mu. So d, so d mu d mu phi squared. Okay. Um, and other terms. I mean, this is intuitively clear if I if I understand that this Kadanov blocking is nothing but the Wilsonian effective field theory picture uh, from the last lecture, meaning that in the last lecture we integrated when we defined the effective field theory, we integrated over a shell in momentum space between 
a lambda zero and a lambda, right? We integrated that, and that gives us a dependence on the scale lambda of the parameters. Depend dependence of the parameters on scale lambda, while uh, the dependence at lambda zero is considered negligible. Um, so correspondingly now going to X space, so doing the Fourier uh, transformation, this integration over momenta between lambda zero and lambda corresponds to uh, a sort of integration in X space between some uh, uh, over some value in X space. Um, but we are in the discrete space, so that integration means averaging, right? So it means we're averaging over this block of size um, S in terms of the lattice size units. Um, so, uh, so it's really the same uh, picture. And in the Wilsonian effective action, we saw then that when we integrated this, so we defined the theory in the UV where we, where we said that the coefficients uh, CI of the, of the higher order terms were, were much smaller, even in terms of the scale, of the units of the scale, so were basically zero. But then when we integrated out um, uh, down to, to, to the momentum scale lambda, we got back uh, um, these higher order operators with non-zero non uh, coefficients, with uh, sizable coefficients. Um, so then in, in X space, we expect to get the same thing, so that uh, we block, we do this Cardano blocking, which is it's equivalent really to in integrating out from lambda zero to lambda. And, uh, and then we expect to get higher order, um, higher order operators in the, um, in the theory, in the Hamiltonian, in, in this description. And then these are the higher order, these are example, two examples of higher order terms, right? This is, uh, as I said, this is d phi squared times phi squared. So this is operator six. Uh, dimension six operator, and this is d squared phi, everything squared. So this is also dimension six operator, okay? So these are uh, exa two examples of dimension six operators um, in the theory. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I, I, I left it as an exercise to show in a bit more concrete way, this statement. So the way I said it is was perhaps not uh, completely clear, but try to uh, try to, the, the exercise is to try to um, to see from this path integral that something like this happens. Right. All right. Um, So now we'll, we'll also so the, the, now we'll we'll do the same kind of picture from last lecture, but in terms of the Hamiltonian and this discretized theory. So we're we're writing a Hamiltonian um, with all possible terms in the Hamiltonian, s alpha of phi, with some coefficients, with some parameters in front, k alpha couplings. And then the blocking corresponds to the an action, the transformation on the, on the space of coefficients from the original ones to the final ones. And that's in the description from la last lecture, in momentum space, we had the evolution of the coefficients ci um, with lambda, okay? So let's say 
in the way I described it at uh, lambda zero, we had some dimension two and dimension four uh, classical uh, terms, and then higher order terms from six forward. Um, and, uh, and then perhaps these higher order operations at lambda zero were, were negligible. So this is, that is to say that we can start, start with this, which is also uh, dimension four. So, well, this is dimension two and this is dimension four operator. Um, and, um, um, and then all the other were, all the other were, were negligible. But, but we can say that there's coefficients there's all all uh, terms, all the operators, but just that the coefficients in here are, are much smaller initially. And then we do this blocking, and there's and that corresponds to an action of, on the space of all possible uh, terms in the Hamiltonian. So, uh, so these terms are changed, but also these terms are changed from almost zero to something non-zero. <clears throat> and this uh, this dependent with the scale momentum scale last time and x phase in now corresponds to the renormalization group transformation since that also was also a scale transformation so last time it was really rg transformation because it was in momentum space so then we define, uh, formally we say that this RG transformation depending on, the, in, in the case of blocking, depending on the parameter of the block S. So this T RG of S acts on the parameter K alpha and you get these new parameters T R G S K of alpha. Then the renormalization group fixed point is the point at which if you do one more scaling, one more blocking, uh, you don't get uh, any change in the scale. So the fixed point is scale invariant, right? So in other words, TRGK of S, okay, uh, alpha, at the point, at the fixed point star is equal to K alpha star. <clears throat> so, the conclusion of all this is that we think of the um, we think of the um, um, we think of the renormalization group as just a coarse graining procedure. Coarse graining meaning this blocking, averaging over a block. Okay. So, renormalization group is coarse graining, that is blocking. All right, now let's understand a little bit more this, um, the, the picture of this renormalization group um, transformations as blockings. <clears throat> let's do some definitions also. So let's define the critical surface as the set of all points attracted uh, by the fixed point. So they, they all go towards the fixed point in the RG transformation. Uh, another mathematical way of describing this would be to say that the, ba uh, the basin of attraction of the fixed point under RG is this critical surface. So when I do n RG transformation, so T n RG of S on the parameters k, you go to k star. When n goes to infinity, you go to k, k n star. Um, <clears throat> so then this fixed point is a fixed point of the RG 
group is really identified under the under this um, new picture as the uh, critical point or the phase transition point in critical uh, phenomena. So the so in terms of the RG transformation comparing with the theory of spins from before, the, the phase transition point, T critical, was a critical point, a fixed point on the RG group uh, flow of the corresponding field theory. Since both physical fixed point and critical point were scale invariant, right? They were, um, in terms of the critical point, we saw that the correlation length went to infinity, so there was no uh, mass scale anymore, scale invariant. In fact, scale invariant in general means conformal invariant. Never mind that. But... <clears throat> so that in particular means that psi goes to infinity on the critical surface. So. As we go towards the critical point, we decrease, we, we um, increase psi. Um, that means that the couplings of uh, various materials belonging to the same critical surface, meaning all of the uh, Psi goes to infinity when beta goes to beta critical, are different yet they lead to the same long distance physics, right? So, so you have theories, so the, the critical surface means um, it's a surface in parameter space, right? In the, parameter, in the space of parameters um, of the theory. These parameters are evolving with the RG flow. So as you go to the fixed point or critical point, uh, the, the parameters change. So you start with some initial parameters, with some theory that looks different. But when you go to the critical point or fixed point, you go, it's the same one. So you, 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 you have the same behavior. So you have a bunch of uh, theories that um, uh, that have the same behavior um, at the critical point, and that's the universality that we mentioned before. That you have various theories, but then the the way they go to the critical point, it's uh, defined by some uh, um, by some given numbers that are the same for many theories. Okay. Um, now let's expand near the critical point. So let's consider uh, then that the parameters are the parameters at the critical point, k alpha star, plus some small variation, delta k alpha. Then the uh, RG transformation on, on k is k star, because that's invariant on the RG, plus the transformation uh, acting on k alpha. So I write this transformation as a matrix. So matrix T in uh, the, the space alpha of parameters. So in other words, sum of alpha prime, T alpha, alpha prime, delta k alpha prime. And there are, of course, higher order terms because when I act with T on K alpha, I don't get just something proportional to, to delta K alpha. I get also higher order terms, proportional to delta K alpha prime squared and so on. But to linear order, this is what happens, linear order in delta K alpha. Then let's consider, so this is a matrix now. Let's consider this matrix uh, a basis of eigenfunctions without eigenvalue lambda alpha. So T alpha alpha prime 
v alpha uh, v a alpha prime uh, somewhere alpha prime is lambda a v a alpha right that's the eigenvalue eigenfunction uh, problem for the matrix d and um, let's expand the couplings this the coupling variation, this delta k alpha, in this basis, yeah, a alpha. We write it as h alpha, sum of a, h a, v a alpha. Then the Hamiltonian, which I remind you is k alpha times uh, uh, the operators, right? S alpha. Um, is written as h star h at the uh, at the fixed point, which is some of alpha k alpha star, the fixed point values times operator s alpha, plus uh, h a these parameters times v a, which are uh, sum over alpha um, these small parameters VA alpha times uh, operators S alpha. <clears throat> then the RG transformation acts on the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues by multiplication. Right? These are eigenvalues and eigenfunctions for uh, the RG transformation. So, um, so the, the RG transformation acts just by multiplication with a lambda a, right? So v alpha goes to lambda a v alpha and the same. Uh, and, and v a also goes to lambda alpha v a. So h goes to a star plus sum of a lambda a to the n h a v a v a. So now you see explicitly these eigenvalues. Um, so the way, uh, the way, what happens under RG flow when n goes to infinity. So we can define, so uh, HA multiplies VA, which is an operator, right? VA is this uh, eigenvalue V a alpha times the operator S alpha, sum over alpha. So this is an operator V a. So uh, this, um, this operator is called an irrelevant operator if la lambda a is smaller than one, because then it means that after n terms, this is suppressed, lambda a to the n goes to zero, so this is suppressed, you go to the fixed point. Uh, so that's why this is called irrelevant. It becomes irrelevant of a, af after many uh, uh, steps in RG. Um, but if lambda A is positive, uh, is greater than one, sorry, then this is a relevant operator because this is, increases away from the fixed point in the RG. And lambda equal to one, uh, then uh, HA is called uh, a marginal operator. Um, that means to, we need to consider higher orders in the perturbation beyond this linear analysis. So I said I defined this matrix T, T alpha, alpha prime as the matrix in the linear order expansion. So, so T. TRG on, on the parameters K is the K star plus the linear term, but then plus quadratic, plus cubic, and so on. So I, I, I um, consider the eigenfunction, eigenvalue problem for the linear term. But if the linear term has an eigenvalue of one, uh, then uh, I have to go to the quadratic term. And if that has also, eigenvalue one, I have to go to the cubic term and so on uh, to see whether it's actually relevant or irrelevant. 
But if it, it remains marginal to all orders, so lambda equal to one, not only on linear le level, but at all levels, we say it's exactly marginal. And then the RG transformation has no effect on it. Um, so we see then that the critical surface that I mentioned is spanned by irrelevant operators, irrelevant deformations of the Ham Hamiltonian, right? So uh, an irrelevant, if you add a, an irrelevant operator here, then you're on a fixed, uh, on a critical surface because when n goes to infinity, you go to the fixed point. Okay. On the other hand, uh, the relevant deformation of Hamiltonian takes us away from the fixed point. So after a few steps, the RG trajectory is dominated by them. Um, more precisely, if you look here, what happens is what it's dominated by the um, by the operator with the highest eigenvalue lambda, so lambda a one, which is the highest. Lambda A1, which is the highest. So this is this is a um, pictorial uh, um, analysis. So the critical line in this represents the critical surface. You know, this is a multi-dimensional space, but I just uh, I just um, describe it in terms of two directions. A direction with lambda small than one, and a direction with the largest of the largest relevant operator, lambda a one, that is positive. So the RG flow, if you are on the critical surface, it takes you towards the fixed point, right? So if you're here, it goes the fixed point is here. If you're here, you go like this. If you're here, you go like this. On the other hand, if you are on the largest relevant operator uh, direction, so if you do that deformation, if you're here, then you go here faster and faster. Or if you go in the other direction, you go also faster and faster. Now, if you are here on some generic point, you have a deformation, let's say, you started the deformation that's mostly irrelevant, that has a small critical um, component, a, a small uh, relevant component, then what happens is that relevant component increases while that uh, irrelevant component decreases. So you go like this. And eventually, you go uh, onto, the, uh, onto the relevant uh, deformation. All right. Um, let's uh, consider the critical points near the fixed point. <clears throat> so let's isolate this largest deformation with uh, uh, lambda a1 or lambda1. So then the action of the R RG on k is uh, k alpha star, the fixed point, plus this larger deformation, plus the, 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 small, uh, the large deformations, the other large deformations. Then plus quadratic terms in the, in, in the in h, plus cubic terms, plus so on, right? Um, <clears throat> and let's also assume that uh, this h h of beta, so this uh, so I've expanded the the deformation of parameter in the uh, in the vas. Um, so with so this is a, um, a parameter deformation 
So one of the parameters uh, that was important for us, so a parameter um, that was a uh, relevant deformation was uh, um, was a mass deformation, right? So the the, the quadratic term in the uh, Hamiltonian had the mass mass term m squared or mu of beta in the in the um, spin description uh, times phi squared, and that mu of beta we've did, we've expanded it in terms of uh, um, beta minus beta critical. So we'll do the same for a, a generic for a generic theory in a generic dimension and so on. Um, in terms of the largest uh, uh, relevant deformation, so largest relevant deformation is V A one alpha. The um, for the R G uh, step. Uh, lambda a1 is largest, is greater than 1 then. And the parameter, uh, the parameter of the theory of the deformation, h a1 of beta, is expanded linearly, like in a Taylor expansion, in terms of beta minus beta critical, with, with coefficient h c a1. And then there are higher order terms in the Taylor expansion. Then, after a few more steps in the RG deformation, as we said, the, 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 the terms which are less with, with lambda A1, lambda AI uh, smaller than lambda A1 become less important. Um, and the most important is this one. So we can approximate, after n steps, we can approximate on K, we can approximate it to to the fixed point KL alpha star plus lambda A1 to the n H1 of beta A1 alpha. But H1 of beta is this beta minus beta C. And since lambda A1 is greater than 1, we can define a, a quantity nu um, by, this, um, by this equation. So lambda A1 is greater than 1. And lambda A1 corresponds to blocking by a, uh, um, a dimensionless uh, uh, size s, uh, uh, a size of s uh, lattice sites. Um, and, um, um, and this s is to the power 1 over nu, by definition. So lambda A1 is s to the power 1 over nu. Moreover, Let's define a sequence beta n that goes to beta critical by this relation. So H A H A1 of beta n. So, so beta is 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 a parameter, right? This it's beta is is a temperature. It's a parameter, but I mean a, a characteristic of the of the uh, of the, uh, the state of the system. But uh, let's consider this sequence of states, beta n, going to beta critical. Um, and, uh, and then s such, such that this product, so h a1 of beta n times lambda a1 to the n, is equal to h a1 of bet, uh, which is equal to H A one of beta n times S to the one of a new times n, but this quantity is equal to one. Okay, so uh, so that always after this n R G flows together with beta n going to beta critical, I have parameters k alpha star plus, this is 1, v a1 alpha. Then that implies that s to the n is approximately 1 over 
beta n minus beta c h a one c to the power nu. Okay. So since that was my definition, and then as I said, this was k alpha star plus v one times v a alpha. Then that means that we we stay a, a fixed at a, in a fixed point with respect to the well. <laughs> Uh, a fixed point with respect to the fixed point. Um, uh, <laughs> we stay fixed away from the fixed point, right? So on this, uh, so this would be the RG trajectory. But I couple it with a with a modification in beta, such that as I st I don't go on the RG trajectory, but I stay instead at at the uh, at this point. Well, sorry. Um, the other ones can go to zero. So, uh, so I stay here. I stay here. So only only on the large largest relevant direction. Okay. On the other hand, we saw that the two point correlation function goes like the two point correlation function, to the, the web of fn, uh, phi n, phi zero, goes like one over n to power two alpha, n being the um, distance in units of uh, the lattice size. So that means that under the blocking, it transforms like this, that forms like. Um, so under the blocking goes x goes to x over s, right? Which means uh, and x is replaced by n in this description, and then this goes um, like x s to the minus two alpha. But then, uh, but then, um, if I apply that now, this is a yeah confusing. I should have uh, yeah I should have wrote, written something else here, uh, m perhaps, and m because otherwise it gets confusing. Um, so, but the point is. This goes like the distance over two to the alpha, but since I rescale x, then I rescale uh, the two point function by s minus two alpha. Uh, so this is one blocking, but then you do n blockings, then you get s to the power minus two n alpha. And then this divided by Sn and T n R J. However, since we also want to multiply uh, to to change beta um, um, in such a way to, to stay a fixed point, uh, fixed uh, away from the fixed point, there shouldn't be uh, um, there there should be no non-trivial dependence on the couplings and the scalings, right? So this this one should be. Uh, I mean, this dependence should be independent. So should only depend on x over s n, right? So under this transformation together, so blocking together with beta n going to beta critical, then g go, should both to depend only on x over s to the n. But on the other hand, in general, um, I have that g goes like exponent minus x over xi if x is uh, much larger than xi. So I can, I can certainly do that. Um, and, then, um, and then that means that, so by comparing this behavior, um, Uh, 
yeah, so so it's a, it's a function of x over s to the n, but also it's a function of uh, x of a psi. So then I should so I, I I should say that psi of beta n should, is supposed to be uh, proportional to s to the n. So this behavior should be this behavior should be equal to this behavior. Uh, so psi of beta n should supposed to be proportional to s to the n. Um, but uh, so removing the n, I just call it beta. But then s to the n um, was equal to this beta one of beta n minus beta critical to the new times some constant. So uh, so this is one over beta minus beta critical to new. So this defines the new that I we talked about. So we talked that indeed psi goes like one over beta minus beta critical to a new. And we see what new is. New is defined by this relation. <clears throat> so lambda a1 is s to the one over new. That also means that uh, that um, then under uh, under blocking um, uh, well when I replace k with k alpha star plus va one alpha when I stay fixed away then it goes like psi minus two al two pi minus two alpha because this was s to the minus two n alpha but Xi was proportional to Sn, so we get Xi minus 2 and n alpha. Xi minus 2 alpha. So, uh, and then alpha, 2 alpha was also equal to d minus 2 plus the, which is a classical dimension plus the anomalous dimension. And then uh, by transforming to momentum space, instead of g of x, uh, writing g of p, then this power psi minus 2 alpha goes to psi to the, uh, so psi of minus 2 alpha would be psi of minus 2, two eta. Right, so how does that go? Well, okay. Uh, yeah, there's something. Oh no, yeah. So, so, so psi minus two alpha is psi of two minus d uh, minus eta. So this is two minus alpha psi to the two minus um, eta, like this. But then the uh, the Fourier transform also changes uh, by. Uh, uh, dimension of of d, so this goes like psi to the power t two minus uh, eta, and the momentum space formulation, this one, the final one, as we said, the momentum space formulation of this uh, blocking formulation is really the Wilsonian effective action formulation from the last lecture, so. Um, yeah, so that's how we finally got to um, a description, um, the description from the last lecture. Uh, all right, so that was all I wanted to tell you. Uh, do you have any questions? Can somebody check that you can still hear me? Okay. All right. So that means you have no questions. Um, so I'll uh, I'll end the class here. Um, next time we'll uh, start with uh, we'll describe lattice uh, field theory. 
which in some sense we already started by describing this digitalization. Uh, and after that, we'll, we'll start with uh, the Higgs mechanism. Um, OK, so I'll see you next Tuesday at 10. Bye.